it's up for the speakers. Um, we would love to hear your voices, but um, we will do this session. I'll be asking some questions. Um, we'll have our panelists talk a little bit um, about their career journeys, their life, how they got to be where they are. Um, and then we'll save some time towards the end here. I'll give about a five, 10 minute warning um, and we'll have any students or anyone ask additional questions. Um, I should back up one step and introduce myself. I'm Sam Palmer. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I am a career educator for the College of Liberal Arts, as well as the Warner College of Natural Resources. And um, I am so pleased to have you all here and get to learn more about you. Um, just before we start, um, I want to acknowledge that um, we may or may not see our own identity within these panelists, and that's perfectly okay, because we can still um, achieve the same career path, and we invite anyone here to have that kind of conversation in this session and throughout your time at CSU. So the Career Center does provide identity-based programming, for example, just last week we had Latinx at work, um, as well as Pride at work. And both were recorded and they can be found on the Career Center website. So today let's focus on career stories and navigating a liberal arts major in the quote unquote real world. Um, and I'll let the panelists introduce themselves, your preferred pronouns, your title and where you currently work and then we'll dive into our questions. So thank you again for carving out the time. And anyone can start first with your introduction. I feel like we probably should have rock, paper, scissored before um, we started this. I'll kick us off. Uh, my name is Rose. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I am the museum manager up here uh, in Frisco, Colorado at the Frisco Historic Park and Museum. I can go next. Um, my name's Makita. I use she, her pronouns as well. And I am a diversity program manager or the diversity program manager for early talent recruiting at Zillow Group. And I am Eric Roche. I use him, his pronouns, and I am the budget officer for the city of Pearland, Texas. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. So I'll post the questions that I'm going to ask in the chat so everyone can reference them. Um, but we'll start off with our first one here. Um, and anyone can go first. You can rock, paper, scissors. It's up to you. Uh, but tell us about your career journey. So what was your CSU major? Um, if you obtained an additional degree, please let us know about that as well. Um, and what was it like when you graduated and where did you go from then to now? And that can be a very curvy line, right? Um, I'll take this one and go first and throw as we did the honors last time. Um, it feels like yesterday that I graduated and that's because every day feels like the same this last year, but I uh, went to CSU obviously like everybody else and I graduated in 2015. And so when I came into CSU, I, you know, wanted, my thought was that I wanted to go to law school because I love to talk and love to argue and I'm very, very good at it. And that just felt like a very natural place for me to go. But CSU does not have a pre-law degree and the closest um, thing that you can get is an interdisciplinary liberal arts major based on the capacity to uh, kind of build your own degree essentially which is like right up my alley so I really loved having the capacity to decide what I took and so I took a lot of um, a lot of the classes that we have that are around law but I had um, minors in ethnic studies and diversity in law which was extremely exciting and just in the general sense that I got to learn about the different intersections of our identities with um, U.S. law so like Asian Americans in the law uh, and American Indians in the law and all the things that we know we get to experience. And so I had a really good time, you know, doing all those things. And I took lots of classes and I was like, wow, okay, love this so much, but like an additional four years of school sounds nuts. And I'm just not going to do that. <laughs> and there are many ways that I can use my skills. And also I wasn't too sure, you know, 
what that path would look like for me and where it would go. And I just, it wasn't, it wasn't aligning for me essentially. And so I did a quick Google, which I love to tell this story because I have just feel like I got so lucky the universe really, I legitimately Googled like policy, diversity and inclusion, leadership. I literally was like threw in like three different words. I can't even remember exactly what they were. And was like, what grad degrees can I get that like mixes these things together and out popped public administration. And I was like, oh, okay, like, let me see what that's like. And so I like did some Googling. And so then the fall of my senior year, I was like registering for class. And I was like, let me see if we have public administration. And sure enough, we totally do. And so I took uh, public administration 101. I got the most basic class and literally on the first day. It's with Dr. Opp. And she actually spoke to one of her classes last week because she still runs the whole world. And I love her so much. But on the first day, I was like, oh, so love this. That's where I got to go. Love it so much. And so then I took every public administration class that we have, including urban planning and all the things that Dr. Opp teaches, basically. And I was like, wow, so got to get a grad degree. And so I figured out what schools I wanted to go to. So I ended up going to uh, University of Washington's um, Evans School of Public Policy and Governance, because at the time they were the number four um, public administration program in the nation. So they were my top pick. Uh, and they were my top pick specifically because they're the only public administration program, or they were, that has a social um, equity and policy track. A lot of places have a nonprofit track and all of those things, but only the Evans School had social equity social policy as a track that you could focus in. And that was obviously very precise to the things I like to do. So I went there. It was great. I minored in, um, you know, I focused in social policy and equity. And while I was there, I, you know, did an internship as part of what you have to take in order to graduate. And so I, and I internshiped at, or I interned, excuse me, at a nonprofit. And I was like, okay, this is fun, except I just paid $100,000 to get this degree and y'all are not going to pay me enough money to pay for this. So like, what else can I do? And how can I take those skills that I've learned and put them into some and put them into a different frame to make them work for me? And so through my experiences at CSU, I ran a lot of clubs on campus and was extremely involved. And I realized like, okay, like love talking about diversity and equity and inclusion. And I was always tapped to talk on panels and different things and lead programming about that. And so I was trying to figure out, okay, that feels very natural and very much like at home to me. And how can I lean into those skills? Um, that I just are God given skills that I have. And so I figured out that, oh, like diversity and inclusion is a whole job that people have. And I wish somebody told me because no one did, but I didn't tell, and that's okay. So when I graduated from grad school, I um, I kind of got two jobs at the same time and I panicked a little bit because I was like, wow, I don't know exactly what I want to do, but I paid a lot of money for this degree, so I better make it work. And I figured out, okay, I want to be, I want to work in diversity and inclusion full stop. That's what I want to do. But I also knew that because I went, you know, through grad school and undergrad without taking any time off, I don't have a lot of tactical experience, right? Like, even though I have the capacity and belief in myself that I can do anything because I, we all can do anything for our minds too, but I was like, nobody's going to hire me if I like don't like learn how to do stuff for real. So I got a job as a consultant in the small firm in uh, Redmond, Washington, there where uh, Microsoft is and Nintendo. And so I was a BizOps consultant for a while working with Microsoft clients. And so I wanted to build my project management experience because to be in diversity inclusion, a lot of it is around program building and strategic thinking. And so I knew I wanted to build those skills, but I also wanted to stay really close to uh, the diversity work. So I started working as a consultant, but I also started as an independent consultant with a different company um, focusing on diversity and inclusion. So I became a facilitator. And so I facilitate and still do um, trainings around uh, all kinds of diversity and inclusion topics, whether it's unconscious bias or power and privilege and oppression and all of those things. And so I did both of those jobs for two years. Um, while I was at uh, the consulting firm, I switched from being external facing because I hated it so much and could not care less what they were doing over there at Microsoft. A snooze was not happy. And I was like, okay, I got to do something else. So I pivoted to work internally on the um, on that people team. And so I was owning early talent recruiting, essentially, and building programming for the company. And so I launched their first intern program while also getting to uh, launch and build the first uh, ERG that the company had. So I built uh, the first women's ERG and it was so fun. And I took those two things and then uh, an opportunity presented itself at Zillow. 
And I jumped on it because earlier that year, actually the year that I graduated, I went to an event at Zillow Group and I was like, wow, I love this so much. This company is awesome and I like have to work here. But at the time there were no opportunities. And so I just networked and stayed really close to people at Zillow. And then a job came up on LinkedIn and it literally said like posted 30 minutes ago. And I was like, that is the one, have to have it. And so I reached out to my connection and I had a friend that worked there and kid you not, the job was literally on his team. Like it was actually on his team. And I was like, nuts, perfect love when the universe comes together. And so I did an informal interview and then went through the interview process and ended up on the team that I'm in. And it is an extremely dynamic role. And so I've actually kind of pivoted even in scope because the role was uh, kind of built for me. And so I originally started as an early talent recruiter, which I love and I love working with people, but it's a lot bigger than that, what I want to do. My, you know, life commitment is to changing the way that we people get to be and feel at work. It is extremely important that we feel welcome and included in work because we spend literally all of our adult lives in the workplace. And it is unacceptable that some folks who look like me or the people on the call are not, um, the space is not built for us. And I feel like at this point in time, I don't have any time to waste and I don't think anybody else does. So I'm here to shake every table to make sure that there is space for people who look just like every single person on this call. And so my responsibility as our um, diversity program manager on the team, or rather I should back up, early talent is the team that owns all um, internship opportunities, entry, you know, all pathways into Zillow at large comes to the early talent team. And so I'm responsible for executing and building on our diversity recruiting strategies. So how do we find the best and brightest talent, but what, how do we create space for them and how do we not only find them, but keep them and retain them when we get them and build programming to support that as well as owning our like diversity conference strategy. So if you see Zillow at Grace Hopper or SHIP or Nesby or any of those conferences, I'm usually there. I would say behind the scenes, but really I'm a front of the scenes kind of girl. So I am all over the place making sure that we are doing our best to find talent. I love working with students and young people because I think it's extremely important that we reach back as we climb. And I know as a first gen student, college was extremely difficult for me to do essentially by myself without having parents or anybody else to look to. I'm the first in my family. And so it was really critical to me to have um, support or, I, you know, people who are telling me, oh, you can do this and here's an opportunity and here's a pathway. And so I take it very seriously that I get to do the same for other people. And also my job is just so fun. I get to build our external partnerships. I get to do all kinds of stuff and talk on panels like this one for all kinds of things in order to make sure that folks know that there is a place for them at Zillow. And if there isn't one yet, I'm here to build it. And so I need your help to do that. And so I get to do a lot of really cool stuff and I love it so much. So here I am. And we also are a distributed workforce. I got to move from Seattle to Dallas because Dallas was a, a better fit for me at this point and wanting to, you know, buy a home and not just creep on my dream houses on Zillow and be able to buy one in a more affordable place, you know, and, you know, build a family and sit down some roots. And so it's a really dynamic place to work and I've been enjoying it. So life has been pretty good, not without its challenges, but I think I've been able to make it work for me. So I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. I think I answered all the things I hope. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's going to be a hard one to follow. You have so much energy. I just got to like absorb that through the screen. I got to do it. Um, all right, uh, Eric, if you don't mind. You I'll got just, it, you got it. <laughs> I'll just go next. Go for uh, it. I am the classic millennial. I actually started off in journalism um, at UNC in Greeley. And then I did that for three years. And then I realized that that really wasn't my calling. I didn't really want to do some of the reporting I knew I was going to have to do. Um, and I had gotten a job offer to um, run a sunglass hut in Macy's in Littleton down south. So I said, I'll do something else. And so I went and I did that. And then I was like, oh, I really like kind of need my bachelor's. Like I need to do some things. So I went to Metro for journalism. Took a semester to realize I was still correct. Wasn't for me. And so I sat there with my all of my like credits in front of me. And I said, well, what do I want to do? It's like, I got a bunch of English credits. Mm, I got a bunch of history credits, I have a bunch of political science credits. And I was like, you know what, at the end of the day, if I'm going to do this and spend so much time in the classroom and spend a bunch of money um, while working full time, I'm going to do something that I love, like what makes my, my heart happy. So I picked history. 
Um, and so I ended up being able to graduate from Metro um, with a bachelor's in history and a minor in political science. And then the ultimate question of like, well, what do you do with a liberal arts degree in history? What do you do? Um, and I kind of, you know, same thing, like the universe kind of lines it all up for me. Um, I had one of my uh, sorority sisters, her company was hiring a human resources. Um, oh, I forget what the actual title was, but like entry level human resources. And I said, I can do that, right? At that point I had, um, I'd been running sunglass huts and lens crafters. Um, for like six years. Um, I'm definitely a it took a long, long to go all of my all my credits and my classes. So I was like, I'll do human resources. That sounds fun. And so I did. Uh, and it was a ton of fun. Um, I got to learn all sorts of new things. I got to work with a group of women who were just brilliant. They're the cheerleaders. They're passionate about what they do and about making sure that people feel welcome at the table um, and making sure people feel safe. And that was the big piece that I focused on was making people feel safe. Um, Cause especially in really large companies, bad behavior can fall through the cracks really easily. Um, so I, you know, at 25 in my power heels, like trying to change the world. Um, unfortunately, um, there was a lot of shifts within that company and it was kind of time for me to leave. It was time for me to go do something else. And so I actually went to CU Denver and did HR and finances for CU Denver in the bursar's office where I learned a lot more about student debt, a lot more about what kind of some of the costs are to, to operate a university and some of like the behind the scenes um, struggles that um, administrative pieces have. But I was still sitting there and I was like, well, this is fun, but is it really what I wanna do? Not really. And so I, I don't know, I kind of like took the leap and I was like, I'm gonna go to grad school. I'm gonna go get a master's and I'm gonna go get a PhD and I'm gonna teach and I'm gonna teach medieval history. So I, I applied to all these universities, right? I applied to all these universities and I got in um, to my top university and then I got to CSU. And I sat there with my advisors from my undergrad and I was like, what do I do? And the universe again, lined it all up. I did not get funding for my top university. Um, so I did not go and CSU offered me, um, a full ride. So I was a teaching assistant. I had a stipend, all the things, um, that make CSU so fantastic. And I said, well, that's easy enough. I'll do that. And then I realized that, well, maybe medieval is not the best idea. I kind of had this big moment of self-doubt where I was like, I don't know if I can do it. Like, it's a huge thing. I said, you know, why don't I just, I'll start small. And CSU has a public history program at the master's level. I said, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do that. Like, let me get my foot in the door. Let me make sure that like I can do this. Um, and so I did, I did public history museums and then I graduated and now I run a museum. <laughs> Sometimes it works out. That was great. <laughs> um, so my name's Eric Roche and I, I went into CSU and I think Dr. Opp was name dropped earlier. She, she pushed me into my field and really kind of, I wanted to be a lawyer too. And she showed me, uh, she was like, look at what lawyers actually do on a day-to-day -day basis and make sure that's what you want to do. And um, I'm really grateful that there's people who enjoy doing that. I would certainly not be one of them. I would be a terrible lawyer. Uh, so, you know, Dr. Opp encouraged me to go into to public administration because I think I, ha I had a lot of classes with her and she saw that I sort of had a pragmatic approach, um, especially as I grew in political science. If, if you're graduating for, with a political science major and by your senior year, you're not kind of like, eh, all these ideas have problems. Like if you're coming out of there going, the Democrats are always right or no, conservatives are always right. You've really missed the point entirely. Um, so, you know, the, the more pragmatic and data driven I got and the more I became someone who I changed my opinion when the data says we should do something different. Uh, you know, she, she pushed me to go get my master's in public administration. So I, I did. I went to the University of Kansas. Uh, didn't know anything about Kansas, just knew that they had a, a wonderful program and it was very focused on local government, which was interesting to me because I felt that one, I could have a really big impact there uh, as opposed to going into the, the monstrous machine that is the federal government or even state governments. And state governments at the time weren't 
working so well uh, coming out of the 2008 recession, right? I graduated in 2011. So local governments, on the other hand, were doing much better. And there's over 18,000 of them everywhere. And every country has them. And I can go work anywhere in the world I want, essentially. It's um, a wonderful degree to have. And for those of you who don't know what an MPA is, it's just like getting your master's in business administration, MBA, but for the government sector. And so, uh, you know, my, my specialty is kind of policy analysis and data-driven management. Um, and so when I was with KU, I was lucky enough to get an internship for a, a small city with their budget office. It was a great internship. I actually got paid a little bit. Uh, definitely encourage inter people to seek out paid internships. I wouldn't take an unpaid one. Um, I just think that system needs to go away. Interns are, are worth way more than they're paid anyway. Um, and it also guarantees that they're going to be caring about you, right? They're paying you, so they're going to care about your development. So I got some experience that way. And then I got to uh, got the opportunity to interview for a really high level internship with the city of Kansas City, Missouri. There's actually two Kansas cities. There's one in Kansas and there's one across the street, literally in Kansas City, Missouri. The Missouri is the really big one that you always see on the news and has the pretty skyline and everything. And they had this uh, wonderful opportunity to interview for their fellowship, their management fellowship. And I got in there and met the other panelists and you know, they have a happy hour the night before where you get to know everybody. The panel was like 14 or 15 people of all these super impressive directors. Uh, very intense. It was like a four stage process. And by the time I got to my interview, I'd basically given up. It's like, there's no way I'm competing. I'm competing against people who are graduating with MPAs and JDs at the same time. I don't even know how that's humanly possible. All these other people have experience. I don't have experience. And so I kind of just took it easy. and was like, well, I'll, I'll enjoy this experience, but there's no way I'm going to get it. I got it. Um, I was actually in the middle of having like, um, you know, kind of a, a breakdown with my wife of like, man, I really wanted this. I can't believe, you know, I, they, they interviewed me. This is going to be such a letdown. And I got the call, like, as I was having this breakdown and got the job and uh, it really worked out well. Uh, a couple of years into that fellowship, I, uh, wrote an ordinance for Kansas City to expand its open data programs and data operations and really just stuffed it full of best practices that I could find. And one of those was to create a chief data officer position. And that sounded really cool. It was this new thing. It was the, I think at the time it's called like the sexiest uh, job in, in the United States or something like this. Data was the super cool thing. And uh, great. I wrote the ordinance, nothing really happened. And then a few months later, my boss, the city manager, who's sort of like the CEO, uh, introduced me on the phone as the chief data officer. I wasn't aware I had been appointed to this position. Um, and so I kind of walked my way into that one. And like everyone else has said, you know, luck kind of plays a, a role. And so as chief data officer, I got to work on all these great, how do we protect residents' privacies? What does the internet of things look like? How do we what, it, what is a smart city? Is it even worth it? Like, should we be putting money into all this technology or should we be putting money into weatherizing homes to save people $100 on the utilities and really trying to bring equity into that discussion? Um, and that's something that had been missing from data-driven management and data discussions is like, you know, we can measure equity and measure service delivery and make sure we're doing a good job. And I did that for several years, uh, worked on a lot of great projects, but I wanted to take a new role where I could have more influence in the organization. It felt like a lot of times I was recommending best practices. I was saying, hey, I think we should do this, but I couldn't implement them myself. I didn't have that ability. And in local government, the budget person is often required to get on board. And uh, they're the person who can really push because they control where the money comes and goes from and which projects get funded. So naturally, I took a budget officer position here in Paralands where I could also do my data work. And now I get to push for funding alignment to the projects that I really see that kind of uh, academic knowledge base says like, hey, this is a good program. This is going to re have returns. So I can push for things like, okay, well, instead of police officers, should we be hiring social workers instead? Let's have that conversation. I can introduce those conversations and they have to have them because the positions won't be funded unless we can agree to it. And you know, you win some, you lose some, but it's more important to have that conversation. I can also bring up uncomfortable truths like, hey, uh, I, I don't know what this city's fire department looks like actually right now, but in other cities, 95% of the fire department is white guys. 
but the city is not 95% white guys. Why is that? Is there something systematic we're doing here? And I can get into that space. And moving to a smaller city has really kind of given me the opportunity to work across a number of areas and silos and projects. And I feel like I'm having a much bigger impact for residents and employees. So it's, um, it's been great. And um, like a previous speaker said, I, I moved to Texas because the, the cost of living is really low here. Uh, the weather is great, uh, except for like three months of the year, it's a little warm, but it's, it's been absolutely wonderful. And uh, while I do miss working for the big city sometimes, uh, it's, it was probably the right move at the right time. Y'all are so cool and fun. I'm just like, oh, you all have really awesome stories. And I can also see like patterns between them all. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your journeys. Um, so this next question, this is actually something Kelsey and I talk about with students all the time in the College of Liberal Arts. And so your insight is gonna be awesome here. And so thinking about how your major relates to your career, what skills are the most transferable? And is there anything that like surprises you? I know some of us talked about, we went one direction with our career and then it was like, hold on back up. And it is probably because of a skill, right? So start thinking about that and I'll let whoever wants to go first to share their knowledge here. All right, I'll go first. Uh, so I, um, I'm working in the field I got my major in. Um, one of the big differences between myself and some of the other people in my cohort is I walked into my master's program at CSU with no prior experience in museums. I came from guest service. I came from retail. I came from human resources, um, people management. Um, I came from a much different background than the other people I was surrounded with. So when then it came time for me to interview for jobs, this job in particular, I got because of my other skill sets on top of having a, what they considered a expert level education. So when we're thinking about museums, we're thinking about, well, there's all these different little pieces. And so it is also um, how well can you set expectations for guest service? How do you manage people? Um, the internships, um, and we mentioned internships a little bit earlier, um, and I don't think I could clap hard enough for it. Um, unpaid internships are a real problem within the museum world. And um, I have a personal just passion for demolishing them. They're unnecessary. We can talk at length about unpaid internships. Um, but the internship I did do with the National Wildlife Research Center in their archive um, it started off as a summer internship. It turned into a year-long internship. And a lot of those skills of being able to sit there and do a project and complete the project, um, not only was I doing archive work, which means I was like cataloging slides from the 70s and 80s, um, I was also building websites um, and I was creating digital history. So, you know, for me, for at least for this job, it was a lot of my outside but then also those internship skills that became um, so important to, to landing the position that I'm in. Yeah, I, I can go next. So I, I think political science really gives you the skills to hear an idea or an argument and in local government, right? You're, you're in the grocery store and especially this is true in super small towns. You're like, oh, there's the mayor or the city manager. People walk up to you and tell you exactly what's on their mind. And it does not matter at all that you work for the local government and do mostly like potholes. They'll be like, I wanna tell you about the tax structure of the federal government and how it's unconstitutional and the income tax shouldn't exist. And you're gonna listen because you're a nice person. Um, I think political science gives you a lot of tools to kind of understand the lens people are coming from and strip it down to that bare, like what assumptions are they making? Are they trying to make an equity argument or an efficiency argument? Are they trying to say that, you know, this is about individual rights or political accountability? And the more you can understand their argument, the more you can try and implement a, a solution or a policy that actually fixes the problem instead of kind of just adding another layer of bureaucracy that fixes this specific item. Um, so that that's one really important skill set. I think 
political science forced me to write a ton and I wasn't the world's strongest writer. I'm still not. Uh, but in my role, I have to write a lot. And the hardest thing has actually been going from having 20 to 40 pages to make my point to having one or two pages of which people are going to read the first paragraph and, uh, you know, judge it pretty quickly. So that that's probably true in almost every career, but it, it is a hard transition. And then I would say economics has been really helpful, but not for the reason you would think, right? You would think being in a budget office, of course, I pay attention to economic forecast and we have to do modeling and that sort of things. So it's very cool if you're into that. But more important is this sort of mindset of how are people making decisions? And it kind of pulls in the economic psychology of things and how do I structure systems to avoid moral hazard and you know get employees to make the best decisions and you know, kind of have that system wide view where you're kind of just creating a system that a free market, if you will, that allows people to do what's right for them and create the most overall good while also guarding against some of, you know, the outliers and negative, you know, negative outcomes that we see. So um, that's been really helpful. Okay, I love everything y'all said. I yep, yep, to just plus one to what y'all said, but also, I feel like I have a billion answers for this question, but I think the first thing that immediately came, immediately came to my mind is not just how like my liberal arts degree has been transferable, but just a college degree at large. And it, having the degree and what it takes to get the degree is what is probably the most transferable about going to college, if that makes sense. Like in life, it, like, in any job, you have to do stuff that you do not want to do. I don't care about it. I think it's dumb. None of it makes sense. I don't want to do it. But you first you whine and then you do it. Like some of the stuff we do in college, like I don't recall what I did. No, no clue. But I had to do it in order to get to the long, the, to play the game, to get to the end goal, which is to get the degree. You have to do it. And like, you learn something by doing things you don't want to do always, whether or not you enjoyed it because you enjoyed the content, but there's always something that you take away from doing something that you don't want to do. And every single job is like that. We do not love every minute, every piece of your job. Like there are things that you have to do in order to get what you want. Sometimes you have to do this task that I think I didn't, you know, I wasn't aligned to that direction of the program or whatever it is, but you disagree and you commit because you can see the bigger picture. Like, every job is like that. You have to see the bigger picture of why you went to college in the first place. And that is what helped you like just be successful in the long run. So I feel like I had to just call that out. Like the fact that we got a degree, it, awesome, because we had to do a hell of stuff we did not want to do. <laughs> so that sets you up for success in the long run because you know how to do it now. You already did it. It's fine, right? Um, outside of that, I think one of some of the biggest skills that were transferable is I would double down on the writing piece especially in tech, you have an idea, awesome, write a paper about it, show me what the program would look like, who are we serve, Who are we supporting, what's the outcomes, what does success look like, how are we measuring success, what are the metrics, because even when things are right ethically, everything is a business, whether it's government or the, or the private sector, it is a business, and there has to be a business case for why we're doing something, what is it driving, even if it feels intrinsically right and we should do it and we're probably going to do it anyway, but like, we still need to know why and like, where is it going? And like, what's the business getting from it? And like, what, how can I scale this? Is it scalable? Why is it scalable? Like you have to write all the things and you have to be able to argue your points. You have to be able to understand research, understand data and make it work for you. I'm not the biggest data person at all. And I think Eric, you were exactly the person that in grad school when I was taking budgeting, and other things, I was like, I literally don't want to do this because there's going to be somebody who loves this. And I just want to tell you what I what report I need so I can make decisions with it. I don't need to know how to do it. So like, that is my whole ML. But learning how to do it is useful because I have to be able to make decisions based on data or other information and put it into a, into a structure that other people who don't have my idea can understand. How do you bring people along? How do you help people see the vision? How do you... How do you drive forward? And essentially, we learn those skills at school. Like, how do you have a project with a person who's not doing any work and figure out how to still get a good grade? Hello, that happens at work all the time. Like, you don't leave that behind. Work is, inherent, is inherently collaborative. Um, even in the jobs that you're an independent contributor, work at large, is career is collaborative. And so you learn those skills 
in all the things that you're doing at school and it seems like it's small or, you know, nonsensical, but it absolutely is all very impactful and powerful into the work that you're doing every day. And then I think the last thing I would say about what skills I think are most transferable um, from both of the degrees that I have is understanding other humans. You know, I studied, you know, ethnic studies, and then, of course, public administration is about how do we create policy and programs that support people and understand government and how we can do things better, policy analysis, that kind of thing. But inherently, it takes a historical framework, like which I got from ethnic studies, diversity in law was like, I need to understand different people's experience with the same system because it's very different. Obviously, as a black woman, I understand exactly how my experience is very different. But like, I didn't know like what is dynamic or unique about the uh, Asian American experience. My mind was blown taking uh, Native American history. It was like, uh, how do we do this? And how did the government do this? And like, just learning so many things, but that colors the way that I'm able to think about our experiences in the workplace, where I'm able to engage with other people. And so I think the biggest thing that I got or takeaway is like, you have to understand people and their perspectives, their walks of life, because everybody is different, but it is exactly what drives them to make the decisions that they're making, it's exactly how you can better serve people, is to understand what their unique needs are based on their experience, and you have to open yourself up to learning those things, and you get that in school, whether you really like it or not, you got to hear that dude in the back who always has something to say, even though you don't care what he's talking about, but I promise you, you know more about him now, because he had something to say. So I think it, it all of it is very useful every day. Thank you, everyone. Oh, yes. <laughs> My brain is exploding in the sense of like, these are awesome things that you could bring up in an interview and talk about, you know, how you got from point A to point B and why you qualify for this job. It's like all these skills that you all need right there. So thank you. Um, I do want to be mindful of time. And so what we're going to do here is I'm going to ask this third question because I think it's important and fascinating. And then whatever time we have left, we'll have um, our guest. Um, oh, no. Kelsey's giving me a no. So we will just continue on with that question. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Kelsey. Okay, so last question here, um, potentially. How did your identities or life experience impact your career transitions? What resources or community did you turn to? Yeah, I can go first this time. Um, so I, I live, I've lived in a variety of places, right? I, I lived in Olympia, Washington. I've lived in many cities in Colorado. Uh, I lived in Kansas. I've lived in Missouri. Now I live in Texas. I also have family all over the country. And seeing how all these different communities work and being a part of them has been really beneficial. The biggest one, though, was moving to Kansas City, moving to a major city where that wasn't as affluent as the places I had lived and seeing what real poverty looks like and what real, you know, they have a very high homicide rate and seeing how that affects people on a daily basis and living within that community and understanding them and talking to them. Uh, you know, it really shifted my perceptions of, of the, frankly, the role of government period, um, just by having that experience. So I'm, I'm very thankful for being in Kansas City. Um, I would say that, you know, the most impactful like resources I could turn to or you know I use my alumni groups a lot uh, whenever I'm looking if like I said earlier I can work anywhere in the country I look up alumni in that area and plug them even if they have nothing to do with it hey I'm looking at this job in Leavenworth Washington I noticed you run a business there can you tell me what it's like living there what are their problems uh, you know I ask probing streets uh, questions about like their streets and potholes and things like that just to get a feel for it uh, I also reached out a lot to just city managers and finance directors. And I've found, and I probably the rest of the panels have too, that people are more than willing to help someone because they've been in this position themselves. And people have reviewed my resume, they've done mock interviews with me, and those have paid off tenfold. And uh, it also builds relationships too. So not only are they happy to help, but they're kind of the groups that might have insight into like, hey, there's a job coming down the line, you need to watch this website, I think you'd be good for it. Um, someone helped them and they, you know, I'm now in that position where I like to pay it forward too. So uh, reach out to people. They're a tremendous resource.
Um, I can go next. Um, I was like looking at you, but I was like, are you going to go? Should I go? Um, I think I've, my, uh, my personal identity is what has in, influenced, you know, my career trajectory and, or rather not necessarily my career trajectory, um, but actually, no, I would say that too. My career, direct, my, my career trajectory and my career transitions, I should say. Those are like two hard words for me to say clearly. Um, but I, you know, I'm first gen, uh, a college graduate, first gen, you know, um, graduate degree, you know, holder, which is a truly powerful thing to have. And so, you know, my whole life, my parents have been teaching me, you know, grit basically and how to work extremely hard, but not only how to work hard for yourself, but work hard for the community around you. I'm from a community based culture where nothing is individualistic while you are, um, applauded for your individual success it is about us and we and it's almost never about you because you're a part of a whole and so that is the way that I move through space I am always thinking about how can I do something that makes me happy to stay true to myself because obviously if I can't fill my cup up I can't fill anybody else's cup up but at large I'm always thinking about what is the benefit for my community at large how can I change the way that other people are living or experiencing or moving through space and that has always driven my drive for whatever it is that I want to do. I want to always be working with people. I always want to be helping people. I always want to be thinking of others in the work that I do, whether or not they recognize that the work is for them. Like I get, I kill myself every day thinking about how can I make things better, faster, stronger for interns that look like me? How can I make, you know, programs that help keep people and make them feel valued? They do not know that, that, that I'm the one doing that. No one knows that it's me except my teammates, but it makes me uh, just, exponentially happy when I can see the data shift, when I can see, you know, we've hired X amount more folks from underrepresented communities or under-resourced communities than we did last year, than we did last season, than we did a month ago, right? Like that is all that I need in order to continue driving forward. It is not um, recognition for that, but it is the community that we're building and getting to be a part of that. And so that has always driven what I want to do and where I want to go. I think I would double down on what Eric said about, you know, using your network because your network is absolutely your net worth. And so that is how you're able to make it shake. You know, I told the story, obviously, how I got to Zillow was like, I ended up being my good friend that was literally on the team that I'm on, right? Like it was his team and he was like, oh, got you. I connect you here. Like here's we're easy. This is for you, right? Like, and having that connection was obviously very key in me getting where I'm trying to go, but also, um, being able to, yeah, tap into that and by making sure that you're building bridges however you can, but doing it in a way that is um, that is meaningful and not transactional because it's very easy to see when somebody is transactional about what they're, you know, trying to do or they're only, you know, they want to connect with you only because you have something that you can give them versus looking for genuine connection because there's commonality in most people and you can find ways to connect. But if you are only connecting because I'm, yeah, there's something that I want from you. Like people can feel that and they will not be willing to help you because it's not, it's because it's disingenuous. And so I think my network has been um, really essential in how I've been able to be successful, but also not just, um, it's important that you network up, right? We're always looking for mentors or looking for people who've done the job before. How can you, you know, help me? How did you get there? What advice can you give? But it's equally, if not more important to network out on your same level? What are your peers doing? How can you lift and support your peers up? How can you, you know, how can you support whatever it is, whether it's a creative endeavor or professional endeavor? Like I go to everything my friends do. I don't want anything for free. I'm paying full price. I hope, you know, I'm supporting all of the people that are around me because we are, some, we are going to be the somebody someday. I don't feel like I'm anybody yet, but like those CEOs have to start somewhere, right? Like, and they're with their pals. If you look at people who are C-suite, majority of their friends are also C-suite and they got there together as a gang because they held it down, right? Because they supported out, because they made sure to do what Eric said and say, hey, look, I think this job is coming and you'd be great for it. And like making sure that you're networking on the same level as you so you can lift as you climb. And I think that that is like, is probably the biggest piece of advice I can give about building community because those resources come full circle and not forgetting that like stay where you are like always be looking for the next thing of course because we all have goals and we're working hard to get fit for purpose and how you but how you do that is by being really strong and paying attention to what you're doing in the space that you're currently in so you can get to where you're trying to go and community is a big piece a big piece of that
Oh, goodness. Um, it's always hard to think of some of these answers because you all have such great responses that I like. I'm like, oh, I was going to say this, but sidetracking into different things. Um, so I already talked a little bit about how kind of my, my work experience um, doing a bunch of different things landed me in the job I have today. Um, what this question, I'm gonna probably answer it a little bit differently, is um, why I ended up staying with public history. So I was like, well, I'll get my master's in public history, I'll figure it out. Um, and one of the things that I, I'm very passionate about is supporting CSU and their mental health programs. Um, my very first semester of grad school, I started, I was optimistic. Um, I got a sinus infection, a severe sinus infection, and then I just kind of fell flat on my face. And it was CSU's resources um, for their students that allowed me to go get the medical help I needed, but then to also go and talk to the counselors and talk about all these problems that I was having and all the self-doubt and all the other things that came up. Um, and so what really happened was I had a really, really hard time in grad school. It was not an environment in which I thrived and it was not because of the program or the department or my peers. It was just me having to sit there and write and read quickly and learn all these new skills um, that I hadn't had to use before. Uh, I also got diagnosed with um, a bipolar disorder while I was in grad school through CSU. Um, and if it wasn't for those resources at CSU, I would never have gone and sought help I probably would have dropped out um, or I would have just been truly miserable and probably not have gotten the job I had. Um, there's a lot of probabilities and maybes and what ifs, um, but I truly credit um, some of the counselors at CSU's mental health um, system and, um, and making sure that I got there and I graduated um, and then they waved at me and hoped they never saw me again because you know I'm on my career path, I'm doing the things. Um, so, that was the big turn point for my transition was instead of trying to go get my PhD, instead of trying to, to do something, I said, let's go the public history route. And while I was in grad school, I became really passionate about lifting up um, these hidden stories about women in labor. And so when I say hidden, I don't necessarily mean this like romanticized hidden that we have. Um, I mean hidden more as in people deliberately hid them. They ignored them. Um, women in labor kind of became my passion project and um, it became something I was really into. Uh, and luckily I'm up here in a place that really supports me and allows me to kind of bring these things up. Um, so hopefully if you ever come to Frisco, you'll see some really cool exhibits in the next couple of years. Uh, but it is a kind of a slow and steady thing, but it is about building work, you know, like both everybody said, network, it's about um, talking to people, it's about making meaningful connections. Um, and sometimes even if it's really uncomfortable, you just gotta do it. You just gotta reach out and say, hi, my name is Rose, let's talk history. Um, I'm working on a project right now where through different community members, I'm uncovering the history of a, of a little log cabin from the 1930s here in Frisco. Um, and I'm, I say uncover because nobody's ever written about it. No one's ever even talked about it. And so it is, through our network of our community members that were unraveling the story and how it connects to our, our broader community history. Um, and I, I think I found some good pieces and I'm excited to kind of bring them, bring them to the public so we can talk about them a little bit more. Um, but yeah, it's, it's all about the community. That's, that's really what history is about is community. So. Well said, yes. Networking is like the biggest takeaway here. Um, and thank you all for being a little bit vulnerable, sharing your stories there. That's awesome. I really appreciate it. Um, okay, so yeah, like Kelsey said, career communities, they exist, build out your network. That's like a constant conversation we're having, right? Okay, we're gonna do like a fire round here, you know, like rapid response. So what are some, um, what are some tips or advice that you would give students that are preparing for their career, that maybe they're about to graduate and they don't know what they're doing, um, but we'll try to keep it short and sweet here, if that's okay. So rapid response, go, go, go. Yeah, I can go first. I can easily uh, do this one short. Um, I think biggest advice that I would give, especially in a panoramic and a, you know, panini and the pandemic that we're in um, is to think about what you want to do 
and how you can get there. I think sometimes we are thinking so big picture, like, oh, I want to be chief diversity officer, which is my long-term goal. But I, you have to remember there are many, many steps to get there. And so sometimes we are like, well, I don't want to do that job because it's not glamorous or not fun. And it's like, sometimes you have to do the job you don't want in order to get to the job that you want, uh, that you really want to do or truly want to do. But always be thinking about it in terms of, if I take this job and while it might not be you know, my ideal, am I getting the skills that I need in order to do the job that I want? So again, you can use it for a purpose. And if, it, and if it does, like I, you know, like I said, a business consultant hated it, but it made me a strong project and program manager, which is what I get to do now in the space that I love. And if I didn't do that job that I hated, I would not have the skills that I need to be excellent at the work that I'm doing right now. And so that's a step that I'm willing to take because it got me where I'm trying to go. But if it's just a job that like, you're taking because you're scared and you need a job or whatever it might be, think critically before you take it. If it's not going to give you those skills that you need to accomplish your long-term goals, then I would advise not to do that. Um, but take the one that's less glamorous, but it gives you the good skills because you'll be able to talk about it in an interview like Sam and Rose were saying, saying like, hey, I did this. Might not be you know, in the same field, but here's why it's transferable. And here's why I can use those skills here to be successful. And that has probably been the the biggest uh, catalyst for my own career personally. I can, I can go okay. next, Rose, is that all right? Um, so, you know, when my, my graduate class graduated and we all went out to get jobs immediately because we're so far in student debt, we got to bring some money in. I saw two things happen. Um, I was part of the group that was applying everywhere in the United States and was applying to any position we could find that, you know, of course, it made sense with what Makita was saying and lined up with our goals, but we weren't limiting ourselves geographically. The other group really wanted to get back into the same small metro areas that they were from and be close to family. And it's, it's okay if you're going to make that decision but it took them a lot longer and it, they might've had to take a position that they weren't necessarily interested in. And it kind of delayed their careers, you know, three, four years. So I would encourage you to be more open to moving somewhere, especially if it's different. Usually that causes a lot of personal growth and will strengthen relationships. And you can always move back in a year or two when you have that experience and have a more built out resume. If you're limiting yourself to one city, one metro area, I mean, there's, if I wanted to come back to Fort Collins, I could be the budget officer of Fort Collins or Loveland, maybe Windsor. That, that's it. Like there's, there's three job openings there for me. Yeah. Um, and so if you're going to be kind of picky about it, it it's, it's going to take a minute and you need to be patient with it. Definitely. Um, so yes, repeating everything um, everybody said so far. We, um, especially within kind of that like public history realm, you have um, places where there's very little job opportunities. You have a lot of steps you need to go through, a lot of different pieces to get to kind of some of your end goals. So my advice would be look at the job descriptions for what you want to do, build from there. How do you, how do you get there? Put together some of those skills, be open to things you may not have considered in the past. Um, maybe be open to uh, a position where you're not really like totally into it. It's not maybe your passion project. Um, and then be open to having some difficult conversations with your, with your family members. Um, I have a significant other and his needs played a big part in where, you know, where did we want to apply to jobs? Did we want to do these things? And it's creating that list. Like what sort of political, you know, environment do you want to live in? Um, what sort of social environment do you want to live in? How far, like what's, what's the airport like? Some of these little things are going to make a big difference in where you go and how you live and how you enjoy your job. Because um, you can live somewhere beautiful like I do, but I'm still driving two hours to the airport through a snowstorm. And that's not for everybody. Uh, so that's my, my bullet points on um, preparing for, for a future in history. Preparing for just life in general, right? <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you everyone so much. Um, again, thank you for carving out the time and sharing your stories. I know we all learned a lot here and I hope we can like build networks together, um, what we were all learning earlier. Um, but 
like I mentioned before, this is recorded. We will be sharing it um, with lots of different professors and students and getting um, people excited about, you know, their college of liberal arts degree and just understanding that they have infinite opportunities from it. So thank you again um, for sharing. And Kelsey, if you have anything, oh, it will be part of some classroom assignments. Absolutely. Exciting. Um, if Kelsey, if you have anything to share, please do. Um, but again, thank you everyone for being here. Yeah, no, we're so lucky to hear your stories. Thank you. Um, that's all we have today. But if you have any questions um, for the career, just for the sake of the recording, you can also follow up with the Career Center. So if you're thinking, how the heck do you talk to strangers? How do I find these alumni? Where do I apply to jobs? How many jobs should I apply to? What is this thing? Um, come to the Career Center. You have you can meet with us for an entire year after you graduate. So don't be shy. Reach out and lean into your amazing community like these three amazing folks. Um, we're lucky to have them in the world. Okay.